You are now listening to the Flurry Podcast, hosted by Marquise Rawls. Another episode of the Flurry Podcast, and this week was a pretty good week. Uh, three really, really good boxing fights came on well. Two really good ones, and one, you know, decently good one. Uh, the first fight I'm going to talk about is Virgil Ortiz versus Maurice Hooker, which was one of the fantastic fights that did come on. Uh, it only lasted seven rounds, which was a little surprising to me. The way it ended was also something I didn't expect to see. And I really don't like when fights end due to someone being injured uh, rather than, you know, someone being knocked out or from a body shot. Maurice Hooker hurt his hand or his elbow or his wrist or he he must have broke or dislocated something. I'm not 100% sure what happened, but you could tell when he winced over uh, holding his like his elbow and his wrist and everything. You could tell there was something wrong with his arm, but he's fine. But before that even happened, and while people may say he used it as a cop out to quit, he did not. If you never had your hand broken or your elbow uh, dislocated or your wrist broken, it hurts like hell. You got to be a, a special kind of toughness to fight with a broken hand or a dislocated elbow or shoulder or a major injury like that that needs immediate attention. So. No harm, no foul, no shade to Maurice Hooker because he put up a hell of a fight. I mean, a hell of a fight against Virgil Ortiz, who I had winning the fight. I predicted he was going to win the fight because I just think that he's the overall better fighter. He's more comfortable at 147. Uh, he's the bigger guy, and I believe he's the harder puncher. So I predicted and I just knew he was going to win. So starting round one, they started off very, very hot. There was no feel out round. Both of them came in with a game plan. They knew I had to do X, Y, and Z to get the win. And both of them executed to the best of their ability. Um, Virgil Ortiz, his plan was to come forward, get hook on the ropes, and you know use his accuracy and his punch selection and his power to, to win rounds, which he was doing, I believe, out of the six rounds that were completed or finished, uh, I believe Ortiz, to me, he won four. I gave Hooker two rounds, and I'll get to Hooker next. But uh, Ortiz, he just looked very, very sharp. Like I said, his punches were accurate. He landed 45% of his power punches. That's pretty accurate for power punches. Uh, he, he was going to the head and he was going to the body. So he's mixing it up as well. And he was always coming forward for majority of the fight. So he really dictated the pace, um, how everything was going, you know, making Maurice hook a fight on, on uh, his back foot, you know, really using ring generalship to just take control of the fight and win more rounds. So now for Maurice hooker. Uh, in the beginning of the fight, Hooker started out using his jab, which I think was effective because he has the longer arms and he's the taller fighter. So I would I would assume that he had the game plan of using his length advantage with the jabs. So he started out using it and it was going good. He wasn't winning uh, rounds one and two. I think Ortiz won rounds one and two. But you can see that Maurice Hooker was doing some things, some different things in the beginning rounds that if he could just put it all together, he could have um, been winning more rounds and it made the fight a little bit easier because in the beginning of the fight, he was using his jab really good with some counters, uh, using one twos and everything. And that was good. Then later on in the fight, he decided to, you know, start, start trading and slugging a little bit more and he was throwing combinations which his combinations were landing and scoring not every single punch was landing he would throw like a four or five hit combination and maybe one or two of those punches would land cleanly then most of them were dodged or black because ortiz he got really good defense i think his defense it's it's underrated uh he was blocking a lot he had good head movement he was rolling with a lot of the punches and uh maurice hooker 
being that he has, you know, a pretty thin forearms, you know, slender type guy, it's a little bit easier to get around his guard or go through his guard, which Ortiz was doing with the jab and some hooks. So um, Ortiz, he just, he just controlled the fight the entire way. Like I said, I did give Hooker two rounds. That was rounds three and four. Uh, round three is a little bit debatable. You could go back and forth with that one, but I think Hooker might have ended that round off a little bit better. And then uh, round four, is, that's when Hooker really started trading, turning it up by throwing his combinations, and I think he just did more in that one round. And that might be the only round where he landed more punches than Ortiz did. So um, they gave him the unofficial score, and they also gave it to Maurice Hooker, as I did. So I had the fight going into round seven, four rounds to two in favor of Ortiz. And then round seven comes, and it's, it's looking like a good start for Ortiz. Uh, he knocks down Maurice Hooker in round six, um, which was really good knockdown. I think it was from, a, was it a body shot that did it? No, it was a body shot that had Hooker like stumbling back. Then Ortiz followed up with two good headshots. Hooker went down. He got back up. He looked fine. And Ortiz, his, his body work was incredible. Uh, there was a body shot he landed in round five that after that round, Maurice Hooker went to his corner, sat on his stool, and he told his trainer, I couldn't breathe. I can't breathe. Oh, man. That's how you know. Virgil Ortiz, he hit him in, in the right, that right spot, right in his chest, where once you get hit there, you can't breathe. And that's due to the consistent body work that Ortiz was doing. Uh, and it really helped with the knockdown. So going into round seven, uh, Ortiz started off strong. He thinks H Hooker is hurt, which he was hurt. He comes out aggressive throwing. Then uh, if you saw the end, you know what happened with Hooker. He hurt his arm or his hand or his wrist or something. He turned around. He took a knee like Colin Kaepernick. And he said, I don't want to fight no more. You know, the fight was still a good fight. It's definitely something that I would recommend to the people who didn't see it. I would still recommend go watching it. And uh, moving forward, what is next for Virgil Ortiz? He said he wants the great Terrence Crawford. And Virgil Ortiz said one thing that I was actually impressed with. One thing about a lot of young fighters is a lot of young fighters, they think that they are better than they really are. Right. And I blame Muhammad Ali for that. I blame Muhammad Ali, not in a bad way, but Muhammad Ali really rose in his stardom by constantly saying, I'm the greatest of all time. I'm the best that ever was, even before he was the best, right? So he was saying how great he was before he was great, but eventually he got to be great. So it was fine. He, he backed it up. A lot of young fighters, they try to take that same approach by saying how great they are, how good they are, and how ready they are for, for the biggest and toughest opponents out there. But most of them never live up to the words that they are speaking to the media and to other people. And Virgil Ortiz, when asked, are you ready for Terrence Crawford? Virgil Ortiz said, even if I'm ready or not ready, I still want that fight. And I respect that wholeheartedly. It's very humbling because he knows, he knows Terrence Crawford has over a decade experience fighting in the amateurs and, uh, you know, doing pro and everything and his level of, of expertise in the ring. It's almost compared to none. Almost. I said almost. Okay. Almost. So Virgil Ortiz knows that, so he doesn't want to, you know, downplay it by saying that, oh, I'm going to go in, I'm going to beat, I'm going to knock him out and everything, because, you know, he, he's living it in reality. And in reality, Virgil Ortiz, you're not going to beat Terrence Crawford. You're good. You might make it a tough fight for six rounds. But after those six rounds, when Terrence Crawford fully breaks you down to your molecular system you are going to get outclassed i'm sorry to say this but that's what's going to happen 
and you just got to take it on the chin. Uh, the second fight was Arthur Betabiev versus Dionys. Dionys. I always butcher up these people's names, so I'm just going to call him D. Um, Better BF versus D, which was, it was a good fight because Better BF, he's always an entertaining fighter. He's always a come forward, strong, tough uh, power puncher who is very crafty in the ring. The second best light heavyweight in the world. I still think Baval is number one. No one will ever change my mind about that. But this fight was a little bit underwhelming. I say underwhelming because in, uh, in Better BF's last fight, which I believe was Vostik, that performance made everyone fear him. It made him into like people were talking about him being in top 10 pound for pound with that performance. So now he, he brought his stock to a whole nother level that now you got to maintain that. You come into this fight and yes, this guy D, you know, a little slick little crafty but he didn't really show me anything where he posed a threat yes he got good counters but better be of you know he he doesn't really have the best defense out there so you could catch him here and there if you're skilled enough or you know make the right adjustments so he didn't really show me anything where he would pose a real threat and he didn't pose a threat in this fight better be if walked him down every single round he hit him he knocked him he bludgeoned him and he won every single round convincingly. But for some reason, the way he did it, it just didn't seem as impressive. It didn't seem as impressive. He seemed uh, slower. He didn't seem like he, he didn't have like that menacing force about him in this fight. And I could be mistaken. I could be mistaken. He been like Darth Vader to this D guy when he walked inside of the ring. But me just watching the fight, he didn't, he, he wasn't fighting at that same level he was when he fought Vostik. And I understand it's a lot of ring rust because he's been out the ring uh, since that fight. That fight was in 2019, so that's quite a long time. But I would assume if you've been sparring, you've been uh, keeping up with training and everything, your ring rust shouldn't really show that much. But still... It's a good fight. I recommend you go watch it. Uh, that win is setting up better BF versus Joe Smith, which is going to be a really, really good fight. I think Joe Smith has one championship belt. Uh, better BF might have two championship belts. So uh, the winner is going to unify all three of them. And then they have to fight Baval. They have to fight Baval. I know Joe Smith, he fought Baval before. And Baval outclassed him like no other outclassed them you could watch the fight on the zone and Baval outclassed them but better be if he never fought Baval because he know he know what Baval would do to him he's ducking I'm saying it now better be if he's ducking Baval or you know they are on two different promotional networks and you know they don't really like each other so but i'm sticking with better bf he's ducking Baval. uh the last fight that i saw was a Coley versus a uh, glowaxi glowaki i i all these people got weird names man just get regular names like harry tom bob jim names that i can pronounce i can't pronounce all these a and glowaski stuff man okay so i'm gonna say okay versus glow that's what i'm gonna say the fight was not an interesting fight to me was it a fantastic performance by okoli yes it was fantastic he showed his high ring iq he showed his craftiness his sleekness his accuracy and his power but like i said before at this point now i am not a big fan of these technical high skilled boxers completely outclassing completely outclassing these lower level boxes i'm not impressed by it no more i'm not entertained by it now he did get the knockout that knockout was entertaining that was a good punch a strong punch 
and it can't it almost came out of nowhere but he landed it and he got the knockout and i'm happy i got to see the knockout but the five rounds before that knockout i, I was literally watching okoli just pick this guy apart for five rounds and glow had nothing he had nothing he was literally just a moving punching bag that's literally all he was to me it's not entertaining and okoli it's not okoli's fault neither it's not his fault that these opponents is not on his level okay it's not his fault at all it's not his fault at all it's everyone else's fault it's everyone else's fault for not being as good as okoli okoli he puts the work in in the gym and sparring and training camps to be as good as he does and if everyone else doesn't it's not his fault so okoli we have to get him some next level competition and i know um the cruiserweight division to my knowledge okay i'm not too in tune with the cruiserweight division they're not that deep as far as high level talent and skill or maybe they are if they are please let me know but from what i know the cruiserweight division is not that deep in in high level and skilled talent so eventually okoli he's gonna move up uh, he's probably just going to unify the division like you sick dig and he's just going to move up because if you want to really be a great or a legend, you got to fight some big future Hall of Fame names. And this Glowowski guy, that ain't it, chief. That is all for the Floyd podcast. I hope you enjoyed. Please, if you are watching on YouTube Hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, write a comment. I reply to every single comment and share with all your boxing friends. I'm out. Peace, King. You were just listening to the Floyd Podcast hosted by Monkeys Rawls. Come back for the next episode or go back and listen to the previous ones if you haven't done so.